Paul wrote his letters. We don't know that he sat down and said, well, I need to, I need to address this, and I need to talk about this, and I want to make sure I, <clears throat> I don't forget to, 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 to address this. Problem. I don't know if he went by an outline, or if Paul just sat down, and, it just, and, he, and, he, and the letter just flowed out of his pen, and, he, and the Spirit directed him in such a way he was just able to just unfold all these things that, that he had in him, that, just, that uh, the revelation of Jesus, through the revelation of Jesus Christ, and, and through him addressing these situations and these circumstances with the brethren, he was able to just pour out so many things concerning salvation in Jesus Christ. We don't know this, but, I, but we do know that we can, we can follow his letters and we can reason upon the things he said. Now, we know in the second chapter of Corinthians, we've already talked about this, he has set the stage. He has set these brethren, and, and, and he's got them thinking in such a way. They didn't take no break like we have. He, he had got them thinking in such a way that he could just move to this point right here. Now, he, do you remember what he talked about in the second chapter of uh, Corinthians there about, you know, um, you can't know the things of God without the Spirit of God. And so he, now he's, he's got them thinking right so he can talk about these kind of things. Now, we know that Paul didn't preach to the, uh, and, and talk to everybody the same way. I mean, you, I mean, that's kind of, we talk about this all the time. The need to be able to, to be able to know what to say to different people. You know, when Paul was selling tents on the side there, when someone walked up to him and he immediately recognized him as an outsider, maybe a, 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 a typical idol worshiper or something, they looked a certain way. Well, he would talk to them uh, about tents and things differently than he would talk to maybe one of the brethren that came up was interested in buying one of his tents. You know, what I'm saying is that he talked to people. Paul preached to the Athenian, Athenian philosophers. He, 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 he didn't preach to them the same way he preached to those in Rome. And he didn't talk to the Pharisees and the religious leaders the same way he talked to them tender brethren and Ephesian elders in Acts 20. He talked differently. Spoke, Paul spoke spiritually to the brethren. And meaning he spoke of the things of God with them. Uh, Paul addressed that part. He addressed that part which, which was alive in Christ Jesus uh, when he was speaking to sense of the brethren. That's the way he spoke. Paul said, we walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. The saints dwell in the heavenly places, Paul said. That is only done in the spirit and by the spirit. God hath prepared a place for the people of God to go. Even in this world, it's a spiritual place. And so God, so Paul addresses the brethren in, in a spiritual uh, perspective, in a spiritual way. It's just important. Why would Paul talk about anything, anything else? Unless he just had to, you see. There are two ways Paul could have spoken. There's two ways we can speak to people. We can speak unto them as spiritual, okay? Or we can speak unto them as carnal. Uh, and this is the way uh, it is. A decision has to be made just like Paul had to make. Well, how are we going to speak to people? And, uh, and we, can, we can speak to uh, men. We can speak to their new creation, which is, uh, which, is, which is one from heaven, made after the image of the one who is above all. We can speak to that one. We have it right here in this verse. Paul said, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Well, Paul told them just a while ago, and back in chapter 2, that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. You can talk to the natural man. You can talk to them about uh, religion, religious stuff. You can talk to them about church stuff. But if you try to talk to them, I talk about the natural man now, but if you try to talk to them un unto spiritual things, uh, they're not going to understand what you're saying. They're just going to be confused. Uh, you can see why it's wrong to talk about anything but spiritual when the saints are together, you see. That's what you want to address, the, the, things, the things of God. This is the way... Uh, we can talk right now amongst one another. This, this is the provision of God. You can know when you, when you walk up to one of the brethren, you, can, you know that you can address them as a child of God, that they are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know you can do that. And that's because that's been given to us to do. We can have an awareness of that. You see what I'm saying, brethren? So we can make it a, a, a directive in our thinking when we're speaking, that we really are speaking to that part that it belongs to God. This has been. This is due to the fact that we've been made alive to God, right? 
Uh, once we were dead to God, but now we've been made partakers of life. We've been, been brought, made alive. Jesus said, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And who was Jesus talking about? Well, he was talking about those who come to him, they would. Who, who are they that come to him? And he answers that too. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Now, we can talk about this all day, but Jesus said I, uh, right there who, who these people are. Now, Paul said, I could not speak unto you as, pure, as spiritual. That's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to speak to them as spiritual, but he couldn't do it because every occasion, we, I thought I made the point, every time Paul had the, the chance and he could, he spoke to them in a spiritual way. And uh, Now, if, you, uh, if you're talking about earthly things, you got the old man's attention 100%. Now, he'll, he can talk about that. If you talk about the spiritual things, then you've got the new man's attention, 100%. But, see, then he drops out of focus if you're, if you're talking about earthly things. We want to speak to one another, and we do this. We do this. I'm not saying we don't. But we want to speak to one another. That uh, We want to speak to the one who can receive the things of God. Now, about this life that Jesus gives, it's, uh, which is entirely spiritual. It's, you know, no one, this spiritual life, no one can get up here and tell you what it is exactly. It's like Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it will. So I, 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 I got a point to make. Nobody can get up here and tell you what it is exactly, such as this is the most important thing about spiritual life. We can't detail it out for you. Not really. Nobody can just, like, nail it down, capture it on paper, uh, make any kind of regimen or routine out of it or any kind of system. Spiritual life is not like that. We can't make a method out of this. We can't say, well, you do this and you don't, and you don't do that and you think this way, and, but don't think that way but, uh, because what the life that comes from God is spiritual and it's full of life and it's living. And the faith we've been given, which is uh, under the management of the Spirit of God, well, it teaches us about this new life. It's not been given to any of the saints, any of the brethren, to try to manage the spiritual, uh, each other's spiritual life. This is something that's been given to us, and, and we live it. We live it out. It's clear that Paul says that the spirit that comes from God, that's, that's the spirit's job, so to speak, that he's what he's doing. It's really enough that we can say that spiritual life is alive and that there are certain attributes the thing to things that are living, and we know we know what it's we, we know what it means for something to be alive. And and once we realize that spiritual life is is a is a living uh, creation of God, then when we can move along and we can figure out how to keep that spiritual life alive and how to tend to it and see to its needs and take care of it. Now sometime. Wednesday morning, March the 20th, I had this dream. I've been eager to share it with you. Matter of fact, the dream set the tone of this message. <clears throat> it's one of them kind of dreams that you can't really wake up, but you know, you're thinking, you might, I've got to remember this, you know. And so I dreamed that the preachers were on the witness stand, that I was immediately in a courtroom setting. I'm not making this up. I was in a courtroom setting, just as real as anything, and I saw the prosecuting attorney was at the questioning stand. I never saw the preacher, just a prosecuting attorney. I never saw anybody in the room, but I had an awareness that it was a courtroom with people, all people in it, but I never saw nobody, just a prosecuting attorney. And he wasn't a white American person either. I noticed right off he was like maybe, uh, he was like maybe uh, an Asian or Middle Eastern or something like that. And he had a strange kind of laugh about him when he spoke. And he was as he was on the prosecu as he was on the prosecuting stand there. He was very upset. And it was like it was a personal thing. It was kind of weird because you think, and for a moment there I thought it was something between them two, but then I realized it was in a courtroom setting. It was like something had been done to him personally. That's the way he approached it. And his line of questioning sounded like this. He wanted to know. Why have you been preaching to us about earthly things 
when Jesus came to tell us about heavenly things. I was astounded. And as he slapped the desk just like this, he said, We want to know why you haven't preached to us concerning the spiritual things of God in Christ Jesus. And as abruptly as I went into the dream, I was gone. That was it. And that's when I thought, i got to remember this. And so it kind of set my tone for the whole message. How many years, how many years have the majority of preachers been preaching to the earthly part of the saints? How can anyone in Christ Jesus grow up unto as spiritual if our focus and our attention has not been placed on that spiritual life, that spiritual part, that new creation that we get when we come into Christ Jesus? Now, we asked a question, and it's answered here too. Can a, can a condition exist where brethren uh, who are not unto spiritual? Can we, is there a situation where we can have brethren who are not unto spiritual, but rather are unto carnal, even as babes in Christ? Can there be a situation like that? Yes, there certainly can be. We have the testimony of Paul right here. This is the way Paul sums up the situation at Corinth. Verses 1 through 4. He calls them brethren on the one hand, and he calls them carnal. Now, Paul can do this because Paul is a spiritual troubleshooter. You know what troubleshooter is. Paul is a spiritual troubleshooter. He was, he was specially qualified to make these kind of judgments. And he could do this just upon the reports he'd heard of the brethren in Corinth. He knew they were walking after the flesh. When he heard what the, he, what the reports were, they're walking after the flesh. Paul could troubleshoot the situation from a distance. Actually, all must be able to troubleshoot in this way, a spiritual troubleshooter, primarily for ourselves, of course, you understand, and, and for the good of our brethren. To be able to discern is what am I doing? Is it of the spirit or, or not of the spirit? Well, Paul was a straight shooter too. Paul was a spiritual troubleshooter who got right straight to the trouble. He didn't mess around. He, he addressed the brethren, and he got right to it. And he shows us how this needs to be done, and he outlines a way that we can do it. His goal is not to offend the brethren, nor to vent his frustration over their failures. Well, Paul, you see, really, Paul, he's aiming to salvage this situation. He doesn't want to put any kind of rubble or any kind of trash or anything on the foundation. He's wanting to aim, he's aiming to restore his brother and try to establish them. But before he could do that, he had to, he had to, he had to, uh, he just had just tell them, <clears throat> I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but carnal. And he repeats it, for ye are yet carnal? Question. Then he asked, he, he asked, are ye not carnal? It was like Paul saying, take a good look at yourselves. There's envy and strife and quarreling and division. Are ye not carnal? One group calls themselves by this name, and another group goes by another name. And, <clears throat> and then again, the second time, he says, are ye not carnal? Four times and four verses, he calls them carnal. And uh, we can look around today. We ask the same question. We can ask it. We say, are ye not carnal? You, we, can, we, can, we can ask that question. Now, the possibility of being carnal or slipping in it over into carnality and not knowing it. Well, it's, it's like getting on the wrong road and not knowing you're on the wrong road until eventually, you know, you say, I think we're on the wrong road. And you're 200 miles out of the way. But you can be on that road not knowing it. The possibility of being carnal, <clears throat> that's the thing people don't consider. The possibility of being carnal. When they're pushing for a once saved position, thank you, they, <clears throat> they forget the possibility of being carnal. Even after we're born again, we can still walk after the flesh. A place that we know where it's impossible to please God. And the potential for this puts our salvation at risk. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about people who are pushing for a once saved position. They forget this. It's like we were born again by the Spirit of God. Before before this, it's the only way we could walk was un, after the flesh, carnal. That's the only walk we had before we were born again. 
But now, the situation for the saints are, we've been made alive in Christ Jesus. We, we walk not after the flesh, minding the things of this world, but rather we walk according to the leading of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> and this is our aim, really. We, we were born after the Spirit, and it's our aim to walk after the Spirit, Amen. that same Spirit, and our ministry to one another. The reason we come here and the reason we get up and we speak and we do everything, every effort is made, is to be helpers of that singular thing. Amen. That we would assist our brethren in walking into the things that pertain to God. And Paul, uh, he told us, we do this, we do this by edifying one another and, and through edification. Walking in the flesh. Well, that's being carnal. We know that. And it's living after the fallen nature of Adam, which has never been an acceptable condition before God ever. The law was given to teach us. We talked about this morning. The law was, was given just to teach us. It was added, like we said this morning, to teach us that very thing about our carnal disposition. The law is spiritual, Paul said. And I am carnal, sold under sin, Romans seven fourteen. God has made, has made provisions as Christ Jesus for us not to be carnal, yeah. you see. We can instead be unto spiritual, unto as spiritual. And while coming into Christ gives us this new nature, the flesh did not leave, the flesh didn't go anywhere. We still have it. Why else would, why else would Paul declare that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit? Having the carnal nature always, always ready to express itself shows it's a great jeopardy we, uh, we face. Living in a realm that actually feeds the flesh. This condition, it accents a great, great uh, need to surround ourselves with those who, who think like this and who are talking after, after this manner of talk. <clears throat> we don't need to be traipsing off or wandering off uh, somewhere else. The saints need to be together. We need to be together as much as we can and, and, and helping one another uh, get to glory. That's how we're going to get there. In the spirit, there's too much scripture about the purpose of the body of Christ. Edification of the saints and growing up into the head, which is Christ Jesus. You know, our salvation, my salvation depends on being established in Christ Jesus. And I need the brethren to help me do this. <clears throat> and, of course, being established... And making it to glory, what well, that's the bottom line after all. You know, unfortunately, in our religious culture today, there are many who wouldn't have it any other way than they've got it. And you got to see this. Than the way it is. They wouldn't have it any other way. But why else would they continue to be involved in a in a circumstance this way? There are those though, on, on the other hand, who are incredibly unhappy. And they're miserable and unsatisfied. And, 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 and when, it, when someone's there uh, with the truth, they're ready to get it. We want to say for these people to just come on out of there. Just come on out. And when they do, let me tell you something now. When they do, God will show them which way to go to find refreshment and satisfaction for their souls. But until they leave, I'm telling you, they can sit there in the pew all day and debate it and reason on it and try to figure it out. And until they get up and leave, okay, they're just going to be wavering and doubting, okay? We pray that God will give them faith just to get up and leave, just like Abraham did. God said, go, and I'm, and, and and I'm and I'm going to show you which way to go. You can say... You can say, how can you speak so bluntly about this? You know, that's, you know, that's a pretty bold thing to be saying, you know. But, you know, uh, I, can, I can talk this way because we've tasted of this yeah. ourselves. A lot of brethren have done this very thing. So you know that when you get out there and start, then the Lord will start directing you. Yeah. All this talk, to, it reminds me of the burden I have for Babylon. Mm -hmm. I do. I have a burden for Babylon. I, I, and we talk about it. And when we do, we talk about Babylon falling and, 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 my, and I just get, I just, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with uh, anticipation that then, then, see, then the people of God will be free to express themselves. It's God who is saving us every day. He's given us a prepared place to go. He's given us one another. 
He has given the indwelling spirit to teach us with power. He's given us comfort and refuge in one another. He's given us one who can be touched with the uh, feelings of our infirmities. It is God who has delivered us from the dominion of this world and who delivers us each day, daily, from the flesh. I say this because I'm talking about the flesh, carnality, as opposed to the spiritual. God will ultimately deliver us from this world and the flesh and when he comes. Now, all this is consistent with Paul's efforts to retrieve uh, Corinth and the, the brethren there. And he he's wants to do this from a place they, they've wandered into that is not pleasing to God. Actually, you know, Paul, God has given Paul an occasion, you know, to minister to them. They're in a place that's full of risk and peril, uh, the carnality. It's just a place where Satan is wide open yeah. to work in deception. They're babes in Christ. He said they were. Mm -hmm. See, so Satan has like, they're, they're not really prepared. They haven't had a chance to be established in Christ. So Satan is, he's really working there. Paul knows this, what he's up against. It's the Apostle Paul who takes great pain in teaching, teaching them and teaching us uh, and he, as he addresses the problems of the flesh. We're no longer under the dictates of a schoolmaster because we've been made alive in Christ Jesus. Even though the law is spiritual, it was intended for the carnal man. And the spirit is for the man of God in Christ Jesus. He, he talked a lot about this in the second chapter. Now, I used the phrase spiritual life about four times this morning. And Paul never used it the first time. Matter of fact, I looked, and I never could work, find where he used the words together, spiritual life. And uh, so I, I, it wasn't recorded that uh, Paul ever used said spiritual life. And... Uh, and I, and I try to use the words that the apostle used. That's just something I like to do. That has always been my goal to kind of get away from the words that I used to use to express the things of God. I, I like to talk as much as I can like the apostle spoke in the scriptures. And, you know, I think that's going down the right road. And, uh, but I, uh, <clears throat> there's so many phrases and things that I used to use that really that I found out they're not in the scriptures and I, and I thought, too, why did we have these words to begin with? And there's a lot of them. Uh, we talk about one of them and one of our meetings. Brother Gibbon talks about how that rapture, that's just one of a half a dozen I could think of. But that, that men have invented words. The reason we have words that, that describe situations, they're, they're really words that men have made up to, to characterize teachings they made up. So they, they got a teaching that's not found in the Scripture, so they got to have a word. You know, the, to the, uh, to go along with that. So anyway, uh, I, I use spiritual life because it's it's, it's to impress the, point, the fact that the life we're talking about is spiritual, and that's why we that's why I use it. Uh, to Paul, a person was either spiritual or carnal, and one was either born again or he wasn't, and that a person can only be spiritual if they have the Spirit of God and if they're walking after the Spirit and unto spiritual. Paul prepared the brethren to hear what he's telling them uh, earlier. Paul has told the Corinthians it's not possible for a person to know the things of God without the Spirit of God. And he's emphatic about this. The things of God come exclusively by the Spirit and those who have the Spirit of God. And that's why, he's so, that's why he called them carnal four times. Without the Spirit of God, the things of God cannot be known. You just, you're, it's foolishness to them to talk to them to talk to them after the spiritual things of God. So spiritual is the key here. This is the most important thing ever. It's spiritual. Paul, he has detected the, the problem here as a, as a troubleshooter and has been associated with the carnal nature. So he could not address them as spiritual. In other words, there were things he wanted to tell them about God about the nature of God, which is all spiritual, and he just couldn't talk to them about God. He had to first address the problems. And then he had to, he had to, he, he just said that the expression of the flesh, uh, the, the expression of the spirit 
what's missing in the assembly. That's what Paul was saying. Spiritual, that's the key thing. Uh, he wanted the brethren to be spiritual. And he wanted them to be spiritually minded. He wanted them to, to in Romans he said, uh, spiritually minded is life and peace. That's what Paul told the Romans. Just, uh, he, he wanted them, earlier told them to, to be spiritual and to have the spirit of God. He wanted them to be spiritual. Uh, it, it was a spirit. He wanted them to be spiritual because it was a spirit who gives all the good things of God to us. When you're spiritual, who is it in this world who doesn't want life and peace, which is a promise of the spiritual minded life? And, who doesn't want life and peace in this world? To be, to be other than spiritual is to be carnal. The carnal mind is empty, uh, intimacy against God. As unto spiritual, allowing the spirit of God to express itself in the brethren. When he, is, he is absolutely free to teach and guide and direct when we're spiritually minded. He's able to give us understanding and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Well, this is necessary, brethren, because we care about this. We carry about with us everywhere we go this potential for the flesh, and we know how relentless the flesh is. Act, we know how powerful the flesh is. Where, if, if you in your sane mind, you're really afraid of the flesh, are you not? You're a, afraid to give over to give to the flesh. How powerful it is. Flesh, it will fight against the spirit. It will not hesitate. It will stand up in the face of God. It will stand up to God and reject God. It will call God, it will, it will call God a liar. The flesh will. It opposes the truth. It wages war against the spirit. If it wasn't for that God had crucified the flesh for each one of us and had to, fight, had to defeat Satan in order to do this, we wouldn't stand a chance, see? We wouldn't, we wouldn't stand a chance of finding God and being saved from this flesh. You just couldn't do it. That's why we're afraid to give, give in to the, that we don't want to give occasion to the flesh. Amen. I want to tell you, in spite of everything we hear today, you hear a lot of this. The spiritual, the spiritual does triumph over the flesh. Amen. That's why Paul talked about, just, he ta all he talked about was spiritual things when he could. That the spirit, the spirit is much more abundant and more powerful than the carnal nature. It is. The spirit excels over the flesh. It excels over the flesh. The Lord, just as the Lord excels over Satan, the spirit, the spiritual nature excels over the flesh. And through the indwelling of the same spirit, we're connected to this power of God. This is to how, how this happens. And it's, a, and it's the same power, you see, that raised Christ from the dead. A spirit of holiness, Paul says, Romans 1. The spirit of God is far superior and mightier than the flesh. So in a, in a world where we're constantly bombarded with all these failures and all this talk, we, we, we can know, brethren, that the spiritual, it is mightier than the flesh. The flesh doesn't stand a chance when we're in the spirit. Amen. We, can, uh, we, want to, we want to shout this, actually, uh, to those who profess the name of Christ. And they are failing on every front. We want to shout that. We want to say that the flesh, it dictates to the, uh, the spirit, it dictates to the flesh, not the other way around. Uh, and this is a matter of praise to God. And so then we're talking about boasting. This is, this is, we boast unto God about this, that we've been, we've been crucified with Christ. And like Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in mine. As unto spiritual, Paul's talking about. Now, many men who study these things, and they've said it could have been anywhere from three to five years where, when Paul wrote this letter back to his, his, um, his home uh, uh, group there where he was with 18 months. Uh, Paul had been gone, they think, three to five years, and now he's writing this letter. And he says in the second verse, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. 
And Paul gives the reason for this uh, perilous condition. They are carnal. Yeah. A situation where the flesh is having the dominance. It's the flesh that has prevented them from progressing. And it's the flesh that has, has not allowed the Spirit of God to teach them the meat of the Word of God. Now, Paul said, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for you were not able to bear it, and neither not are you now able to. And that's, that, that's why this letter is primarily concerned with instruction about conduct, you see, which is an evidence they are not properly, they're not able to properly discern uh, what, the, what the scripture, what the spirit is trying to, well, actually the spirit's not even able to lead them. But they're not able to discern good and, and evil. They're not, a, they're not able to understand the things of God, see. That's, that's what, and that, so he's having, a, he's having a deal with conduct. That's an evidence. Now there's nothing wrong with them being fed. What Peter calls the sincere milk of the word. Peter calls the word of God milk. And there's nothing wrong with Paul feeding them that. Matter of fact, there's nothing else to feed them. There's nothing else to feed the saints but this. When Paul was with them, that's what he fed them. There's nothing else that will maintain life in Christ but what God has said. The word of God is a substance to uh, sustenance of the new creation of Christ. God has made no other provisions to, to feed the saints anything else. Man shall not live by, uh, by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Speaking to the multitudes, you remember Jesus said, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and live and not die. When the apostle Peter says the sin milk, sincere milk of the word, he is, of course, referring back in this, in this text. Back three verses earlier, when he quotes from Isaiah 40, you'll have to remember this, then when he's speaking about the enduring word of God. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you, he says. That's what he's talking about, this, this word of God. Peter says, desire this word, desire the milk of God. As newborn babies desire, desire this, this word of God. We should greatly desire. And Peter said we should greatly desire the word of God. Yeah. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Amen. Who said that? Job said it. Even Job realized there was a part of him that was more important than some other part. A part that only a word from God could satisfy. It, it, was, he, it was Job's desire for God. That was more important to satisfy. It was his awareness and consciousness of God. That was more important to him than necessary food. The word of God is both milk for the very young in Christ and babes in Christ. And it's also meat for the mature in Christ Jesus. We know this by the situation in uh, Hebrews 5 where the need to be taught all over again, the first principles of Christ, is associated with milk. And being able to teach those things and being able to teach those things are associated with me the first principles of Christ is the same word of God from which we teach the deep things of God it's all the same the whole point in Hebrews was uh, that they had digressed to a state of infancy where they needed for plain instruction uh, was needed again they needed it again and the rebuke was they should be now mature and stable enough to be teaching others the implications of the truth of God in Christ Jesus. I don't have no idea how long people in Christ Jesus have been surviving on just the milk of the word of God. You know that's the truth, isn't it? They're never able, they're never able, I don't say they'll desire to, but they're never able to, to move along to a state where it, it can be taken as strong meat where they can be established. Paul would like for the brethren to understand why here in this text. He would like for them to understand why they are not behaving according to the Spirit. He would like for them to understand the nature of the Spirit of God and so they would act accordingly, you see. Amen. Instead of just telling them, you should not be envying and you should not be striving and you should not be dividing. You know, he wants them, he, he would rather them to, to be able to understand it. 
We want to be familiar with the Word of God, of course. We want to know what it says. How, we're, how, how else will we ever be able to draw conclusions and to be able to reason on things of God and to think like Him and to know what He has said and, and, to, and to know why and understand salvation? Able to read upon the necessity why we need God uh, to, allow the, to allow the Spirit to govern our thinking and, and to, to lead us in our thinking and be able to reason upon the Word of God. This is where the spiritual departs from the efforts of the flesh, you see. We talked about this this morning, actually. This is why without the Spirit, the spiritual sense, we cannot please God. He's not interested in, in people who can just, just follow a list of stuff. Actually, we can't anyway, but he's not really interested in that, that kind of effort. He can do better than we can do better than that in Christ Jesus. We've got to be able to navigate in the realm of the Spirit. We are the ones who have been given to do this. We could not possibly think like God if it were not for the for the Spirit of God who teaches us. You know, I used to think this same way, and I know people still do. They want to know why in early, early years. Uh, I, w- I wanted to know why they, why wasn't Paul and Peter, why didn't they uh, why were they a little more straightforward with the details about living under God and, and the, what we call the, what they call the Christian life? Why didn't they just kind of spell it out? You know, you, you go through the scriptures and you look. Where, you know, give me some details exactly what to do and, and what not to do. And you wonder why. Uh, why, did, why didn't they give us some more details uh, about how to live? How, how do we live God, holy and godly in a defiled room? How do we just about go about doing that? And, uh, but you got to ask yourself, really, how would they go about doing this? How would this be? How would they? How would this be done? Right. You know, when when we're spiritual creations by faith, right. and we're being directed by the Spirit of God, how how would they go about doing this for each each individual? Right. This is not done. This is not done, rather than the Scriptures, because God has given us His Spirit to teach us yes. and to know. He wants you to know. And to make decisions regarding uh, living holy and righteously. And not for the world to come, but for this world, this present age, for to be able to do it now. Uh, there are so many things that have to be done that we have to do. And we got to figure them out. That we, gotta, we must know how God thinks. And so uh, guess who knows how God thinks? Paul told him in the sec- second chapter. If the Spirit was an eyewitness to everything that God done... And man for salvation, and he's here in you, and he's gonna he'll teach you personally. Right. You know, if you if you defer, if you think you're gonna approach salvation in your own wisdom and understanding, you're on the wrong road, like That's Brother Jason said right. this morning. You'll be constantly overwhelmed by circumstances yeah. because the efforts of the flesh. You'll never realize overcoming. If you try to approach it any other way, it's, it's, we do it by faith, and the Spirit of God leads us this way. We're going to get away from this preoccupation with the earthly, see, and we want to be as unto spiritual. God has made us spiritual. Even while, the, while we inhabit this flesh, God has made us spiritual creatures. He's given us a spirit. That's a testimony to this. He will, no, he will negotiate the spiritual life for you, brethren. If you read Second Peter one through ten, you will see that Peter is just describing the situation of the saints. And this is often the case many, many, many times in the scriptures. The apostles and the writers, they're actually describing our situation, the situations of the saints in this world. He's describing a people who have been a, who have been enabled by God to obtain the things of which God wants them to have. I'm not going to read these scriptures. We go over these. Uh, you know what I'm, this scripture I'm talking about. The, all these things are spiritual things that Peter says the people of God have been enabled to obtain. They're all spiritual. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us unto glory and virtue. Everything, absolutely everything that God has intended for his people have been made available, absolutely. There's a place where the saints can be where they can never fall. That's what Peter says right here in verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, 
you shall never fall. This is not a place where temptation ceases to exist. This is not a place where the devil doesn't come and continue to tempt you. But this is a place where the brethren are established in Christ Jesus, where salvation becomes a matter of holding fast and standing firm in the things we've been, we've been instructed in, a place where we've been proved and our faith is being perfected. It's a place where we're not thinking about quitting anymore, okay, and drawing back. Brothers, but rather it's a place where the thoughts of glory and the world to come have prod us onward and forward. And all we need is a brother to get up and say, remind me, read me something, you know, remind me of something, O glory land, and see, I'm in that place where I can be easily exhorted there. That's where Paul wanted these brethren to be. It's a place that Paul desired for all the saints, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. People who are not established in the faith, people who are established in the faith, Christ Jesus, they do not fall. That's, that's pretty, that's, now Peter said this, now I could say it too. God has made an arrangement for this. It's a place absolutely certain for the people of God. Didn't Jesus say? Did he not say? And this is the Father's will which has sent me. It was his Father's will that has sent me. That of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. In the end, brother, when it's all over, after the separation of the wicked, if there's any, if there's any regret, and remorse possible for those who go to hell, it will have to be, they'll have to say, God did everything but cram salvation down my throat. Yeah. That's right. Okay? That's right. The most ingenious deception that Satan has ever contrived among the people of God is to get them to fill up their lives with so much religious stuff that they've completely lost sight of the spiritual. I could not speak to you as unto spiritual. Well, we don't want Paul to have to rebuke us. I don't want Paul to rebuke me. We want him to be able to say, I could speak to you as unspiritual. Thank you, brother.